Can everybody uh, see that? More or less. Close enough. Close enough. Close enough. There we go. Boy. Bring him down. Focus. All right. So, guys, I'm going to try to uh, you know, cut through some of the stuff that's kind of the very beginning. It's a little bit boring. It's just about me. Uh, so we'll kind of leave that stuff out and kind of get to the good stuff. We are running about 15 minutes late. Um, but anyway, my name is... <coughs> Uh, my name is Andrew Weebrink. I'm the director of Spirit Research and Innovation for Independent State Company. Can, uh, can you raise those lights up a little bit? I feel like I, I can't see anybody. He's out here. I know that's a fancy long name, but basically what I do is kind of twofold. So 50% of my job is just research, and that's reading dissertations, white papers, uh, going to the library, uh, putting in barrel experiments. So the way that we get our whiskey, the way that you guys are going to taste this whiskey here, we actually partner with distilleries. We give them the barrels for free, uh, and then they put their whiskey in it. We monitor it through sensory and chemical analysis uh, over the course of four years. So we get the whiskey back once a year. We put it through sensory analysis. I run the tasting panel in there. It's about 12 people of industry, uh, industry experts. And then we run it through chemical analysis. And you guys are going to kind of see some of that chemical analysis and kind of make some correlations to what we're talking about here. Uh, the other thing I do is I work with bourbon companies to develop new bourbon products uh, for those guys. Uh, if you own a distillery, which I'm sure a couple of you guys do, changing the wood is just about the easiest thing you can do. That's all you got to do. Call us. We'll, uh, you know, we'll design something up, make something really, really unique. And you just put the whiskey in it and let it go from there. So that's a little bit about me and what I do for independent state company. Uh, this presentation is entitled Inside the Barrel. And this is just kind of a rundown. We're going to look at the oak constituents because you have to know a little bit about oak. We're going to talk about where it comes from. Uh, we're going to discuss some unique barrel flavors that come only from the barrel. Uh, we'll talk about seasoning, charring, and toasting, and how we use those components to actually control and deliver flavor. Um, we'll look at a little bit about color, some of these fruity and floral flavors that you get within whiskey. We'll talk about how those are developed, uh, maybe some techniques on how we as a cooperage can influence that. Uh, and that kind of goes hand in hand with oxygenation. And then at the same time, we're going to discuss uh, double barreling and smaller barrels and what they do uh, for maturation of whiskey. So the oak constituents. Uh, oak is actually a pretty surprising tree. It's really, really simple. It's made up of about four different constituents. Uh, this big part over here, about 45% of the tree is cellulose. Now, it's kind of understood in the industry that we do not get a lot of flavor from cellulose. It's basically just kind of a skeleton. Um, so we'll just kind of stick with that for now. There are some studies uh, you know, going on right now in which we're trying to see if there's any kind of flavor uh, derivation from cellulose, but as of right now, it's kind of inconclusive. Uh, oak tannin, it's responsible for flavor from just, just vaguely. Uh, it's more actually responsible for color astringency, mouthfeel, that kind of stuff. Uh, lignin and hemicellulose, these are by far the two most important components that we're going to study. They are responsible for just about 90% of the flavor in a burger barrel. And more importantly, lignin. Lignin is just an amazing molecule, and it is responsible for a lot of different flavors that we get. So if we take a look at cellulose here, it's basically just a bunch of glucose molecules repeated over and over again. And it's really, really tightly bonded. So the reason we say that you don't get a lot of flavor from it is you know, okay, these are glucose molecules, that's sugar, right? When you heat up sugar, you caramelize. The only problem is you have to heat this stuff up so hard, or so, uh, so intensely, or so hot, to break these bonds apart. By the time that happens, usually any of the flavor compounds have been vaporized. So that's why we say cellulose is not responsible for a lot of the flavor. Uh, tannin, it's this big, ugly thing over here. Again, uh, color, <coughs> mouthfeel, astringency. Tannin is basically tannic acid. So if you mix an alcohol and an acid, you get an ester. So you could get some of those fruity and floral flavors from tannin, but again, we're going to talk just basically about barrel wood wrap flavors here. Uh, hemicellulose, okay, so this is very, very similar uh, to cellulose. It's a bunch of sugar molecules that are basically repeating. The only thing is you have other sugar molecules besides glucose. This one is very, very easy to break apart with low intensity heat. So when we break this apart through toasting, uh, basically what happens is you have a bunch of sugar molecules floating everywhere. We add a little bit of heat. Those caramelize. This is where you get a lot of your marshmallow, uh, a lot of your uh, toasty coffee characters, uh, caramel, uh, that kind of stuff. Now, lignin is, is the one that I want to focus on. And as you guys can see, lignin is just unlike these, which are linear polymers. This is what we call a branch polymer. So the way the lignin puts off so many different flavors, we season or we'll heat it 
toast it, char it, and it might lose a little branch here. And when that branch breaks off, this is no longer lignin. And that might be a flavor compound. We add a little bit more heat, that branch might break off. It might be its own flavor compound, and the compound from which it was born is a totally different compound. So again, this is a humongous polymer. It's random, uh, it's got a lot of stuff going on, so you can kind of see just by looking at hemicellulose and lignin, intuition might say that we get a lot of different flavors from lignin. And this is kind of the way it works here with my water bottle here. So we're going to talk about some, some kind of ugly words here, some big words, hard to pronounce, but basically hemicellulose, you're going to get a lot of these furanic compounds. So 5-hydroxymethylferferol, 5-methylferferol, uh, and furferol. And basically what that is, is just varies varying degrees of toast. And what do we mean by toast? Caramel, coffee, brown sugar, uh, marshmallow, those kind of flavors. Right? And that's really all hemicellulose is going to do for you. It's going to stay in that one flavor zone. Now, Let's switch gears and talk about lignin. One of the first things uh, that forms when lignin breaks down is called vanillin. Anybody guess what that smells like? No. no. Exactly. Uh, then it's going to go over to, and again, these are just a handful of compounds. We're talking three and four hundred compounds in bourbon whiskey that actually contribute flavor. We're just talking about a handful. We couldn't talk about all of them. But anyway, we're going to go from vanillin to sarangialdehyde. That's kind of a sweeter, woodier type aroma. It's actually really, really nice. Uh, and then from there, we're going to go to like the Y Falls which are spices and smokes. Uh, then we're going to get all the way into eugenols, which is just basically eugenol is the compound uh, in clove oil. So when you say we got a eugenol heavy whiskey, it's really, really spicy. Right? Uh, guayacol, that's going to be like your smoked hams, campfire smoke, acrid smoke, uh, barbecue <coughs> smoke. So again, from liquid, we go from sweet to woody to spicy to smoky and everything in between. Just like over here, we have varying degrees of toast. With lignin, we have varying degrees of sweetness, varying degrees of smoke, varying degrees of spice, and so on. And we know how to control the formation of those compounds through our processes. So basically, this kind of science right here, uh, you guys see that at all? No. No. Oh, well, shit. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the point is, is that we talked about maybe one, two, three, four, five, you know, a handful of compounds over here. When we do our GCMS analysis, we look for about 35 different flavor compounds that we feel that we can control. Now, again, I said there's a lot more, about 400 different compounds that we can recognize on a GCMS. Doesn't mean we know what they are. It just means we can recognize them. Uh, these are the ones that we feel we have good control on. So through our seasoning, our toasting, our charring, we can pretty much control where we're going to get these products <coughs> just by knowing what temperatures flavors are developed. So when we do our experiments, we'll get it back, we'll run it through the sensory panel, and we'll also run it through our GCMS analysis to give us these graphs. And that's basically kind of the, you know, the blueprint of the whiskey, is what this is. And we try to get the GCMS and sensory to line up. Uh, it, it doesn't always happen. <coughs> and that's why we always say sensory takes, you know, it takes the cake, it takes precedence. Sensory is above all. So we can look at GCMS analysis and look, oh my god, that looks really, really good on paper. Taste the whiskey, that tastes like shit. And, it line up. and vice versa, it goes the other way. So, you know, about 80% of the time, 75% of the time, they line up. If it tastes really, really sweet, we'll get a big spike in family. You know, that kind of stuff. And that's really, really cool when that happens. But sometimes it, just, it doesn't work. So, um, kind of talking about that, it's kind of, you know, okay, well, how do you take lignin and hemicellulose, which have no flavor by themselves, none at all, and turn them into white call, eugenol, vanillin? Uh, all this good stuff. And we do it through a few different ways. Now, there are some mechanisms that create these flavors that are beyond our control. Hydrolysis, ethanolysis, cast extractive oxidation. Uh, basically, when you put whiskey in a barrel, hydrolysis or ethanol, ethanolysis is degradation of wood by ethanol. Hydrolysis is degradation of wood by water, right? And that, that stuff just takes time. But Seasoning, toasting, and charring, we can really influence the flavor and have a lot of, a lot of control through these methods. <coughs> so you can get a little, some, some idea of those with the test that you do with the distillers? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And that's, and that's how we learn all this information and how we, you know, we have all this different stuff. We have a whiskey library that's about as long as this room, and we've got floor-to-ceiling shelves full of different experiments. Last year, I put out 450 experiments. <coughs> Year before that, I put out 380 experimental barrels. Year before that, it was like 400 again. So 
So we have a lot of different exp uh, experiments studying everything from seasoning times, toasting temperatures, charring temperatures, charring lengths. We did a char eight barrel. It almost fell apart. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just if you guys are curious about char level, and char levels, there's a lot of myths. And I'm gonna kind of I'm gonna kind of dispel some of those for you. But what we found in that char, because it is kind of interesting, is that once you go above a char four and you age the whiskey, basically these compounds that you see and this G flow <laughs> that you don't see, and this GCMS analysis, um, <coughs> actually, no, the more you go above a char four, the more they go down. So that's why we said, why don't you go to char five or char six? Well, it doesn't work. It makes less components. So season. Mostly for us, what we're going to get um, six to 24 months. We do have some wine customers that ask for 48-month material. And basically what that means is we own our, uh, our sawmills. We'll process the stays, we'll stack them up, and we'll let that stack sit outside for, you know, four years. So it looks just like this right here. These are stacks of stays. Um, and that does a lot of different things. But let's kind of focus on a few things here. Number one, it removes tannins. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I like tannin in red wine, but tannin in bourbon, ooh, yeah. You put it in, it dries your mouth out, and you have this really, really overly woody flavor. When somebody talks about over oaked, they say, oh, this is over oak. Talk about tannins. We'll put there, just excess tannins. And we'll explain, I think there's a slide where we can kind of explain that, why that happens way on down the line of maturation. Uh, so tannins are basically tannic acid. So we have a loss of acid, which is a loss of acidity. Everybody follow me there? There's <coughs> potential for esterification, which esterification, acid, and alcohol. So if we remove some of that acid, we remove some of that potential. That's why we have customers that like 24 months, and some customers don't like any seasoning at all because they like a lot of that acid in there. Uh, it reduces the density. So what does that mean? Well, it makes it easier for the, or the whiskey to go back and forth. And also, you get a dinner, uh, deeper penetration of toast and char. So that helps you out a little bit. Uh, but what we really want to see is this breaking down of large wood, large wood constituents. So we go back and we look at lignin. Seasoning will actually start to break this down. So that's why if, you, if you're ever in a beverage, and you walk by an 18-month stack of wood, it smells really confectionery, a lot of vanilla. And that's the reason. It's got, oh, okay, here's a good example. You go into a library, and you smell old books. Right, you ever smell that? That's lignin degradation. Nowadays, they take the lignin out of paper, really high-quality paper, so you don't get that smell. And basically what that is, is lignin degradation. That's the one I got a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> I have to remember that. <laughs> Alright, so the sun helps, the rain, the snow, the ice, the seasonings. Yes, it all plays a part in reducing density. But what we are look, really looking for is basically fungal growth on the stage. So when you walk out in the seasoning yard, you'll actually see all kinds of different uh, fungal growths on the side of the stage. And that is what we're looking for. They, they, they shoot down these little roots and they break up those big bones. Can you guys see that? The, the lines, at least. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to try to explain this to you. Don't, these are just these are just flavors. All right, those are all flavors. That's what it is. And basically, what seasoning does is it does not create specific flavors. It kind of blows everything out. Right. So you can see this one right here, this orange. That's six months season. This one right here is 18 months. So again, it doesn't really say, oh, 18 months are going to get more vanilla. Yada yada yada. You just get a lot more flavor with seasoning. Maker's Mark barrels have a lot of seasoning on uh, We have a lot of craft customers that have 18 and 24 month. Really, really helps these guys. Uh, you know, it gives them a competitive edge because most of the heritage guys, they use like three to six months, right? The seasoning costs money. And when you're filling half a million barrels a year, five bucks per barrel, CFO guys don't like that. Kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, so again, you know, we use this technique uh, for a lot of our craft customers. It gives them an edge, especially because you know they don't have the they don't have the capital to sit on whiskey for six years. But if you use some eighteen month wood and like two year old whiskey, really, really a smart idea. Hey, if you guys have any questions at all, just stop. I know you guys are waiting for the taste. All right. Question. Sure. So, like this year, where it's been raining in Tennessee and Kentucky for the last two months, does that? <laughs> Definitely affect those staves when they're aging. Then it'll Does affect that the fungal growth. Yeah. it'll affect the fungal growth. I was in Alabama fishing this week, and the, the guy that runs the fishing camp, he said, "We only got two rains here." 
One lasted 27 days, the other lasted for 40. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I digress. Uh, very good question, yes. And actually, uh, if you come to my session tomorrow, I've got a slide that shows the fungal growth. And you can kind of see throughout the years that they'll go up and all of a sudden they'll drop back down. And that's just for the reasons you mentioned. So, oak paralysis. Paralysis is a word that means degradation by heat. Right, and I'm going to try to explain this. Uh, you know, it's kind of it, it, it is it's pretty technical. Basically, let's pretend that we have this toasting profile right here. This is just a toast profile. So you start at a low temperature, you finish at a high temperature. Now, we can correlate a temperature to a flavor. So each one of these compounds, they're developed at certain temperatures. And through 25 years of research, we know all these different compounds, these 40, 50 compounds, exactly what temperature or what scenario they're developed in. So again. A toast profile like this is going to have a lot of little individual flavors in it. So that's how we create complexity in barrels. We have toast profiles that go like this. Now, we also have to toast profiles that go straight across, one time, one temperature, right? That's just one big flavor. So if somebody says, Andrew, we've got some two-year-old bourbon. It's not as sweet as we would like it. Um, you know, what can you do? Well, we would give you guys a barrel, like a char one barrel, that's just basically toasted at one single temperature and it just builds a whole bunch of paint. You finish in that for two months, you got a sweet bourbon. So that's one of the, that, that's how that flavor works. You can see similar graphs for toast versus your char. Yeah, and it's, the charring is <coughs> the charring just because wood is an insulator, right? So the, the heat, the, it kind of falls off the deeper it gets into the stove. Uh, so a charring heat curve would look like this, except in reverse. At the edge of the stove, it means the whiskey would be really hot, and then as you get deeper and deeper in the stove, it falls down. <coughs> So, and we're going to talk about char here and explain why char one barrels and char four barrels act the way they do. And this is basically how it works. So you've got this time, you've got temperature, and certain things happen. We talked about tannin and over oaking. Why do we not get oak right at the very beginning? You do a little bit, but tannin is the most heat sensitive compound that we have, right? So just the smallest amount of toasting or charring and we destroy it. We send it all the way back to the edge of the stage. So it takes that bourbon a little while to get back to that and get it. So we say over oak. This is what we're talking about. Uh, hemicellulose, fluid degradation, again, it all occurs at certain points. And, and by studying these temperatures, we, we know how to add flavor and how to take it away if we need to. All right, charring. One through four. The charring system was universal back in the 1950s. Before that, there really wasn't a char one, a char two, a char three, or char four. It was invented in the 1950s. Um, so when you talk about bourbons, you know, back all these bourbons from 1930, 40, they were so good, and they are, and it's for a couple more reasons than just char. But basically, when you made a blend of whiskeys from your warehouse, you weren't blending just a char four barrel. You were blending a char four, a char three, char two, char one, and they blended all that different together, all that different stuff together, gave really complex whiskeys. Um, all right, myth. Intensity of both flavor and color are not correlated with the charred layer of the barrel or the charred level. There is a deeper char, more flavor. Incorrect. Uh, deeper char, more color. Actually, it's the exact opposite. You get char one barrels are darker. Uh, that kind of fools people. Uh, basically, what it all comes down to is this layer that resides, or resides underneath the char layer. It's called the red layer. That's where all the flavor is. Most of these flavor compounds that we've been talking about they're destroyed after 500 degrees. And charring is very, very intense. So basically just vaporizes everything. Now charring is good for subtraction. Uh, one gram of char has about the surface area of a football field. One gram of activated carbon has about 32,000 square feet of surface area. That's ridiculous. Explain that. That makes no sense in my head. What do you mean? <laughs> how? It just, that's, it's surface area. It does. That's, that's, how, that's why carbon is such a good filtration, because it works on the principle of absorptivity. It absorbs good flavors and it absorbs bad flavors. So if I'm a distiller and I say, you know, I've got this product and it's going to be a two-year-old product. I want to put it in the char four to get as much flavor as possible. Well, actually, you're kind of working against yourself. You would want to put it in the char one barrel because basically you're giving yourself a jump start. That whiskey doesn't have to work all the way through uh, that char layer to get to the good stuff. And they're like, well, what about, we want some of that carbon build up. You're going to get plenty of subtraction from evaporation. Evaporation is one of the most, uh, I guess, overlooked concepts in, in barrel maturation. And you get a lot of that subtraction. 
the nastier compounds, dimethyl sulfide. Anybody know what that smells like? <laughs> that, I mean, that, that stuff just takes time to remove it. It goes by evaporation. So when you hear a, a new bourbon is, is, I guess, quote, green, mm -hmm. that's from either on purpose or not using the proper char? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I'm not saying that if you put, uh, you know, bourbon into a char one barrel, that it's in six months, it's going to taste amazing. Right. It does take a little bit of time to work for that char one layer itself. But basically, toasted barrels, uh, you know, for me, I love them because they put out so much flavor. So anything you can do to make this red layer bigger, which is seasoning and toasting, and reduce this char layer, in my opinion, makes it better beer. All right, <laughs> taste it. All right, so glass one of four is the one all the way to your left. I want everybody to pick that up. Just let's just give that a smell. Somebody call something out. Vanilla. Vanilla, big time. Huge. Bananas. I'm sorry? Bananas. Bananas. Bananas? Anybody else? Old black owl. What? <laughs> let's, let's, stick to, let's stick to barrel flavors. <laughs> yeah, let's stick to barrel flavors. So toastiness. Let's just stick with this. Sweet, spice, smoke, oak, and fruity and floral. Let's, let's just talk about those. A little marshmallow. A little marshmallow. So, that's right. Definitely sweet. All right, let's pick up that second glass. Put that one down. Don't taste it yet. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> let's give that one a sniff real quick. Oh, that's got a lot of wood in it. Anybody else get anything besides wood? Maybe a little bit of smoke, a little spice. Which one's sweeter? One. For sure. So, would it surprise you? The first one was a char one. The second one was actually a char four. And this is a two years old. There you go. Uh, char one's definitely a lot more flavor up front, a lot sweeter, a lot thicker mouthfeel. Uh, the reason it has so much of those vanillins and uh, some of those toasty characters, like we call caramel marshmallow, is again because those are basically destroyed at very low temperatures. Now, I'm going to show you the GCMS results of what we just tasted here. All right, think. Yeah. So again, these are just flavors. The blue line is the char one. The red line is the char four. Now look at the char one. Furfural and vanillin. Caramel and vanilla. Anybody surprised that it's, after what we talked about, you shouldn't be surprised, but the char one actually has just as many compounds as the char four barrel. And that's the point. You get the same exact compounds in a char one barrel that you do in char four. The only difference is the delivery and maybe a little bit on the intensity. Char one's a little bit more intense in certain flavors. Pretty cool, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody expect a char one barrel to taste? <coughs> like everybody, I get the distiller, it's gross. Char one, no, we don't want that. <laughs> Give us nobody else. Is uh, there a discount then on char one barrel? <laughs> <laughs> it actually costs the exact same as a char four, believe it or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have a sale every six months. <laughs> <laughs> We gotta move some units. Alright. So barrel toasting is by far my favorite parameter to mess with just because there's so many different combinations and it's the one that we have the most control of. 99% of your bourbon barrels out there are gonna be toasted over an oak pot. Alright? Uh, brown former they do it a little bit differently, they use electric heating or ceramic elements. Uh, we have something similar. Anybody remember that uh, Buffalo Trace collection, the experimental collection, the infrared barrel? Yeah. We did that. That's this machine right here. <coughs> so basically what happens is heat penetrates barrels. Uh, it, it just like different types of heat will penetrate. Like some IR rays will go right through you. Uh, but sometimes they get absorbed by like stainless steel. Uh, so basically what we do is we vary the wavelength of the heat and we get deeper penetration into the wood in different sections. Did you try my wood? <laughs> <laughs> That's almost what that is, but no, we haven't tried anything like that. We've yeah. got a the, the, the the shitty thing about my job is, is that I can't, talk about, I can't talk about the really cool stuff that we're doing because we have all these NDAs. I mean, I mean, if I mentioned one more, Denny Potter would come through here and probably just slap that face. No, but, uh, you know, these experiments that we're showing you guys are not outdated. I mean, this is you know, two years old, four years old, but like the really cool stuff, like the cutting edge stuff, it just, it, 
Oh. <laughs> so in infrared, you can uh, you can uh, regulate the depth as you so yeah, we, so, the, and the char. Both. Yeah, we can regulate the depth and the intensity. So you can have a deeper deeper touch with. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, so as the whiskey makes its <coughs> way back into the barrel, eventually, if your toast is deep enough, it's going to get into that raw wood. And what does raw wood have? A lot of lactones, which can be good. Uh, if they're over concentrated, it gives you woody. It has a lot of tannin. Right. So that's why they say when barrel, when whiskey gets to a certain point, it depends on the aging environment and stuff like that, it gets really oaky. And that's just because it's getting into wood and it has a lot of tannin. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we can drink these first, too. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I'm telling you guys, char one. Anybody? Char four is a little rough, and char one is handy, man. I'm telling you. I, that was about 125 for you, so. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, check this out. Let's look at a charred barrel versus a toasted char one barrel. Let's look at the flavor. Now remember, just random flavors, right? All kinds of crazy good flavors. Here's our char four barrel. Here's our toasted char one. A lot of flavors. And you can kind of see these different peaks, you know, right here. Uh, basically, this toast is called a P37, and I know that doesn't mean a lot to you guys, but this is kind of our sweet spice toast. So what we're looking for is we're looking for a lot of those furanic compounds that give off a lot of that caramel. Uh, ethyl vanillate, there's another fur for all, and we're looking for eugenols. Now remember, eugenols are the varying degrees of spicy, right? All spice, clove. So we got a nice peak at trans iso eugenol, uh, a nice peak at cis iso eugenol. Um, so we've got some <coughs> really good peaks. So do you see, that, is it normally the, the same peaks when you have different types of different, different forests out there? No, well, different forests, yes, but basically when we say, oh, the terroir of bourbon, it makes a difference what's, what the trees are bringing up. No, the tree doesn't care what it's bringing up. You don't get flavor from soil. The flavor differences come from how fast or slow the tree grows. We're going to talk about that. And that's where the flavor comes from. Now, with different species, they might have different chemical compositions. Like, for instance, French oak has about five to ten times the amount of tannin than American oak does. So when we, when we prescribe French oak barrels, do not use these over four or six years, because you will get a bomb. Now, so, would it follow then that a char four would be used for something that you're going to tend to age longer? Yeah. If I was going to have, if I was going to have, I mean, we can't argue the char four makes some of the best whiskey on earth. Uh, it is really, if, if you take the time to kind of say, okay, I want this whiskey to age for this long, I want it to have this kind of flavor. You can really save yourself some time and money by spending a little bit of time on design. Now, if you're going to age something eight years, eight, 12 years, <coughs> put a char four barrel, let it go. Uh, we, have, we have char one and six year old, and it tastes just as good. It just, I mean, it's really how you like your tea. It's going to be different for everybody. How long has toasting really been a thing in the industry? Uh, it's been a thing for quite some time. And, you know, we did experiments back in the 90s with different types <coughs> of toast, but it didn't. Nobody cared. Nobody, <coughs> science, nobody did the science. Nobody, nobody, they didn't give a shit. Um, now, it's been done in the wine business for a long time, which is pretty much where we've adopted all this technology. We make a lot of wine barrels. We've been doing that for quite some time. Basically, somebody just decided to say, let's just take some of the technology and really promote it into the bourbon industry. Uh, we actually sold out uh, our toasted barrels for this year, like two months ago. Because <laughs> people are getting these experiments back, and people are coming into the research center, and they're tasting them, and they're going, holy shit. <laughs> so we sold out. We're spending uh, quite a bit of money to build a new cooperage and expand our toasting capacity for next year. Uh, just because, I mean, people are starting to recognize. Now, it's, it's unfortunate for some of the larger guys because, you know, they're, they're can you imagine, I mean, toasted barrels, they change the flavor profile so much. So, I mean, can you imagine if they changed Jim Bean white? There'd be a riot. People love that stuff. And not to mention, toasting's about an extra 15, 20 bucks. So again, if you're a big company, an extra 15, 20 bucks, that is a lot of money. And they're already making a product that sells. So they're locked into a flavor profile. And they're locked in. Some of the newer guys are really starting to, I mean, I'm designing custom toast from the ground up. We have about 150 different toasting profiles we're going to have. But these guys are getting so geeky now to where they want to understand the process and actually design their own toast from the end of the barrel. It's just really, really cool what they're doing. That's an extra 20 bucks per barrel? I, I'm not in sales. I think it's like 15 or 20 bucks. Per barrel. Yeah. 
But, you know, if you want a two-year-old whiskey and you want to get it out and make it taste a little better, I, to me, you take 15 bucks versus how many, what other, 188 bottles of two-year-old whiskey or 200, something like that. It's pretty, pretty small number. <coughs> All right, toasted. The reason I put this slide in is because I want to give you an idea that this is a GCMS result. So basically, it looks, it's this. And, this one. and basically, what you have down here, each one of these clusters is a flavor. Each one of these bars is a different barrel. So what we did is we took four-year-old whiskey, we put it into five or six different types of new barrels, we let them age for 16 weeks, and you're looking at the results after this. Now, when somebody comes to me and says, Andrew, we want a double barrel into a char three barrel, I say, you should not do that. That's not, what are we talking about? We have to work through that char there, right? See this little blue thing right here? It's not even on that one. That's double barreling into a char three barrel versus double barreling into a char one barrel. So when I say, guys, don't double barrel into a three or four, we show them this, like, oh, that makes perfect sense. The other thing I want to show you is just like, oh my God, into a toasted barrel, just a toasted barrel. No, we can really get some differentiation if we design a toaster. And that's what you see between these, just a lot of differentiation. This barrel and this barrel are actually the same toast, but the gray one is a wave stage, so we increase the surface area about 21%. That's why you kind of see them similar to just bumped up a little bit. All right. We increase the surface area. Increase the surface area. <coughs> Does not mean more extractives. It just means more or faster extraction from rate. All right. Myth. You guys ready for myth busters? <laughs> We're going to bust one. We're going to bust one. All right. This is one-year-old whiskey, I believe. This is a char one barrel. This is a char four barrel. I don't know how well you guys can see that, but. Yeah, one's, one's definitely darker. Mm -hmm. And that happens more often than not. People are always like, wait a minute. This goes against everything I've been taught. And yes, it went against everything I've been taught as well. But anyway, that's just. Uh, char one's darker than char four. Any questions? <laughs> no questions. <laughs> so let's talk about color. Where does color come from? Well, it comes from the red layer. Now, the reason char one barrels are darker is because some of these compounds that are developed at very low temperatures, let's use sarin gelatin, that comes from lignin. When it gets oxidized, it turns into what we call syringic acid. Now, not only does syringic acid lend a very pleasant woody note, but it gives you a shit ton of color. That's one of the reasons why char one, and that's just one example. The other reason is tannin. So, French oak has approximately 10% tannin by the way. American oak usually is about 2%. And now that's, you know, you can have between five and ten times. So on the left here, you have American oak. On the right there, you have French oak. Darker. Any questions? That's why older whiskeys, they always get darker. They have to just get more compounds. But then after a certain period, you know, when it's like over oak, it's just over oak tannins. In the wine industry, though, when they say they end age wine in French oak, they, they often refer to those as softer. Yeah, I mean, and there's two, there's a couple. I mean, tan is kind of a universal term. There's like Elijah tannins and Gallo tannins. There's different types of tannins that we have. Some are water soluble, some are. So that's probably what they're referring to there. It's the same thing with oak lactones. Anybody know what oak lactone is? It's coconut, right? It's that same smell of coconut. There's two lactone isomers: the cis isomer and the trans isomer. The cis isomer smells just like coconut. The trans is a little bit sweeter, but it's mostly grassy. <coughs> so I don't know if I have anything. American oak actually has a ratio about 10 to 1 cis to trans. So basically, a lot more of that coconut in American oak. And French oak, it's about 2 to 1. So that might be some of that ratio of stuff that they're talking about. You guys want to drink? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First one. Now, this is just one year old whiskey, so bear with me. Brand new experiment. Oh, I should mention both of these medium plus char one. That's a touch profile. Do you have more green board paint than any other paint? No, I can't do that. Just in the bottle. Just in the bottle. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you guys really need some more? No, we don't have any. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was drinking. No, the light blue. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
Let's see. Yeah. Makes the dream work. So you guys do your own um, research and stuff with how the alcohol breaks down. Yeah, we do. We do experiments on entry proof, distillation proof, anything that we feel that it will alter the flavor of what's going on inside our barrels. We try to study it. So do you guys have? Do you have a distiller's license, or do you? Buy it, no, we, we, we partner with distilleries, so we'll okay. give them the barrels for free, they fill it up. And like I said, we work with some of those, you know, now the big guys aren't going to vary their entry proof or their distillation proof, so we work with smaller distillers that can do that a little bit easier. All right. Hi. Last number three. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask, so you can change the wood, right? You can change how long you set it outside. You can change your char and your toast and your wavelengths and everything that you use. Your heating element. There's all the different things you can change from that guy. Is there anything else that you can do to the wood prior? In other words, can you, can you soak it in something like a brine? Or is there, yeah, we've you know, done things that. that so, so it's got the experiments that you're trying to do something with that wood to, to help it do something, we, to dry it, then take it. We've it. inoculated wood with citric okay. acid. We've inoculated with different types of enzymes, different types of bacteria. We've put honey on barrels. We've tried everything with every different type of wood. I mean, even possible. like, you know, the, the dry sous vide, you know, just holding something at a certain temperature for a long period of time. You know, what does that do? So I'm sure that there's we, all kinds of things you can play with, right? Yeah, no, there's, and that's what makes this job so much fun is because every day you can think of something, oh, let's try this. And, you know, my boss is pretty awesome. He's like, okay, you, you think it'll work. Most time then. Glass three. A little whiff. Anybody? It's gonna taste. Now let's talk about the mouthfeel. Just remember that, you know, that's kind of the thing. Keep that in mind. Alright, got those thoughts. Let's pick up glass four. Let's give that a sniff. <laughs> What about glass four? Don't like it? Three, I don't like it. Three was very unpleasant. Yeah. What about four? It smells wet. Does that make sense? You don't like American oven. <laughs> Now again, this is 119 proof, it's 12 month, so keep that in mind. So the French oak, contrary to popular belief, it's smooth and it's really, really sweet. Now, there's a correlation between smooth and sweet, all right? So when you get a concentration of heavy extractors, all right, vanillin, serenzaldehyde, that kind of stuff, that manifests itself in a smooth <coughs> So sweet and smooth kind of go hand in hand, it's because of those extractors on there. Most of the other views that come out of Missouri, Kentucky. We buy 25 different states now. Yeah. Wow. yeah. You use Lebanon, Cooper, and Lebanon, Missouri? Lebanon, Kentucky, Lebanon, Missouri. Same company. Same company, that's us. <laughs> We've got here, here where the dark wood or sap wood is the tree. Yeah, sap wood, we try to stay away from. It, you know, there's, what happens is there's a compound called tylosis that develops in American white oak. Basically, what it does is it plugs up the pores so wood won't leak out. Now, You'll have about five to six years of sapwood inside of a stave. Usually the, the more mature sapwood is the one that has tylosis developed, and then it happens around year three. So we try to basically trim off the first couple of years of sapwood. Because we, if there's one thing that these distillers don't like, is leaky barrels. They do not like that at all. All right, so let's talk about fruity floor flavors real quick. What's that? How are we doing on time? Oh, well, we can go a little bit. All right, so fruity and floral flavors don't necessarily come from the barrel. They come from a process called oxygenation. So when we talk about fruity and floral, is it a direct result of oxygen? 
No, it is not. An ester is an alcohol and an acid. With an acid catalyst, it has nothing to do with oxygen. But what oxidation does, what oxygen does, it is responsible for creating a lot of those acids that we need uh, to create those esters. So if you look at ethanol, which is alcohol, we oxidize it, turns into acid aldehyde. We oxidize that, turns into acetic acid. Now, when acetic acid combines with ethanol, <coughs> we get ethyl acetate, the most common ester found in barrel and spirits. <coughs> Um, so again, that's how those fruity and floral flavors form. Now, once we have this ester, we have a process called transesterification. This is one of the magic <coughs> things about barrel aged spirits. That's why it's always evolving. This newly formed ester that we just made down here, it'll actually recombine with a different alcohol, uh, and it'll form basically a different alcohol and a different ester. And then that different alcohol can combine with an acid, and this different ester can combine with another alcohol. It just, it's constantly evolving. Pretty cool, actually. Uh, we talk about oxygenation. What makes oak oak? It's ring porous. And what that means is that basically right here in the early wood, this right here is one growth ring. The growth ring is subdivided into two separate rings. Early wood, which is very, very porous, as you can see, and late wood, which is very, very dense. Right, so basically ring porous just means you have a lot of early wood that's just more dilated. Now, what does that mean for us? The more porous the wood, the easier the whiskey moves in and out, the easier the oxygen moves in and out. Right? So, if somebody comes up to me and says, hey, Andrew, I've got a one-year-old bird I want to put on the shelf. What can we do to get the most flavor? Well, I'm going to give them extra fine grain because it's a lot more porous. Right? That whiskey has an easier time going back in there and getting a lot more of those flavors developed a lot of complexity earlier. Now, the thing you have to remember with extra fine grain, can everybody agree that there's a lot more wood material in this one than there is in that one? That's a lot of air, right? So you have to kind of be careful. You've got to balance it out. This is why most of the guys, and the 8, 12 year old bourbon guys, Jim Beam, all these guys, are going to go with coarse grain. Surface area to volume ratio. The smaller the barrel, the higher the, the smaller barrels age whiskey faster. Anybody have an opinion on that? No, they do not. That's actually the correct opinion. Now, what I like to say is that good whiskey is possible with smaller barrels. We have a lot of people that do it, but they understand the mechanics of it, right? So, they do not age whiskey faster. We look at our four pillars of maturation. These are basically the four things that kind of go. Extraction, subtraction, oxygenation, and reactions. Reactions are this type of stuff, right? The extraction, that's what we're talking like the vanillin, uh, hemicellulose type stuff, some traction is kind of evaporation and charcoal and oxygenation. We just talked about that. So, what smaller barrels really do is they speed up the extraction, but they <coughs> take down the subtraction, they take down the oxygenation, which is really, really important. So, basically, it just kind of knocks things out of balance. But again, we have some guys out there that use these barrels really, really well and they know how to do that. So, oh, oxygenation. Where does this exchange occur? And this is the reason why smaller barrels don't work. So 63% of the oxygenation is going to be through the joints itself. Oak being ring porous, it actually will have oxygenation occurring inside the wood. But basically what happens is 63% of it, once you get a little bit of headspace in there, your oxygen transfer is between that headspace and that whiskey. That's where it's at. So what happens is the oxygen comes into the barrel through the joints. It'll actually get in that headspace. The whiskey will dissolve it. And as it happens, it brings in fresher oxygen. Right? And that's how it works. So if you've got a small barrel, where you know, there's just not a lot of surface area on there, on that whiskey kind of uh, headspace interchange, it takes that down immensely, just because 63% of the oxygenation comes from that frame. Uh, increased surface area, and explain again, <coughs> some more flavors. Uh, this is just a regular char four barrel right here. This is our wave state, which increases the surface area about 21%. Now, when you go to like a five or 10 gallon barrel, you're basically just kind of blowing this extraction graph you know, out of here. So 21% is about as high as we like to go. Ah, double barrel in this plant. So this is kind of, this is some bonus stuff that we had. This is an experiment which we took a two year old bourbon and we dumped it into I think like three or four barrels, studied it for six weeks. So again, here's our char three barrel right here. You know, just kind of, you know, what it's doing. But we have a couple other different barrels that are kind of blown out, all right? So again, different toasts, uh, different barrels, 
Uh, just another reason, you know, when you double barrel something, hey, what kind of flavors are you looking to get? Let's design a toast. Let's not just dump it into a char three because really, if you look at the control whiskey, which is right here, and you look at the char three, it really didn't add any kind of flavors. It just kind of blew it out a little bit, kind of like that seasoning graph. So, and that's all I got. <laughs> industry only uses 6% of the white oak population. So if you want to blame somebody for killing all the oak trees, talk to the paper mills, those guys are a few minus, four and north, and lots of north as well as our barrels. Who uh, funded that study was I asked <laughs> 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 No, that was, uh, basically there's a website that you can go to, and I forget the name of the website, it's, it's, a, it's a government website, basically you can look at like a top, uh, map in the United States and it will show you uh, basically where these different species are concentrated and they take basically same populations and then they kind of expound that. So you can go and check it out. I mean, I'm, not, I'm sure it's probably won't, but <laughs> it's there for a picture. <laughs> but we also get trees from uh, Slovakia, we get them from France, uh, Spain, uh, you know, we get trees. And when you talk about those like French oak, European oak, those are the ones where the constituents, the actual chemistry of the wood uh, starts to change. The other question we get is, are you cutting down younger trees? No, we're not. We cut down trees that are 80 to 130 years old, and they're about 100 feet tall. Does anybody know how many barrels we get out of a 100 foot tall oak tree? Eight. One. Four. And a half. <laughs> and French oak is about a quarter of that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. I've been doing some day drinking. Uh, you've been doing some, there seems to be a pattern. Let's <laughs> <laughs> the third round in. <laughs> so what about on the back end as far as after the barrels have been used, do you guys find facilities that are helping to do some sustainability with those barrels or do you leave it up to the distillers to make that choice? Most, you know, and we deal with about, you know, 400 different distilleries right now. <coughs> uh, you know, the big guys take them about, I think about 80% of our consumption. And most of those big guys, they own Scotch whiskey distillers. They own tequila, so they kind of handle that. But we do have a huge barrel in Cooperage in Louisville, Kentucky that we own. And we will take those barrels back for sure. Yep. So can you take samples of, like if I give you a sample of whiskey with your machine, break it down, you tell us Yeah, if you give me a sample of whiskey, I can run through GCMS, and basically we, it spits out a blueprint of about 35 different chemical compounds that are in that whiskey. And, 35, you know, when you taste whiskey, and I give this to, you know, going into it, you know, saying, oh, what am I going to get? That's like doing a word search without the list of words. The biggest tip that we get, when we look for our whiskey, our sensory analysis, we look, we rate everything on sweet, smoke, oak, grain, spice, and estuary. We only look for seven different things. But those seven different things tell us just about everything we need to know about the whiskey. So I'm sorry, a little bit of advice, but I just when people are tasting and they're like, oh, blueberry and this and that, you know, that's cool. I mean, I like doing that too, but since we're evaluating these whiskeys from one to four years, we can't just put flavor notes. We have to actually quantify that data in a number four. I don't know how much you guys work with data and quantification and everything like that. Everything is just, you know, you guys do something, you write it down, you log it. Now, you know, Lots of articles out there, and I know there are some master distillers in here who might disagree, but you always hear the majority of even master distillers say it's 50 to 80 percent of a bourbon's flavor comes from the barrel. Mm -hmm. What do you guys say about that? 99. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I mean, you cannot, I mean, the, the distiller's job is so very, very important. You're not going to have, I mean, you're not, I don't have to say 100 percent comes from the barrel, 100 percent comes from the distiller, because you can't have one without the other. And you can't clean up, excuse my language, you know, a shitty product with a, a great barrel. It's just not going to happen. I mean, the distillers have to do what they do, which I'll, I'll never understand all, all that's the science that they know. Uh, they have to do what they do, but, you know, make it right. It has to go in right to begin with. Uh, 
That's that's my opinion. We like to stay away from 58%. I know that's kind of what everybody says, 58%, but we like to think that it's kind of an even sport there. That's not like Brad talking. <laughs> He's trained me well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So will you tell us what was poured in each of the glasses? Yeah, okay, so the first one. Oh, <coughs> He's not going to tell you what product. He's not going to tell us the product? Oh, I can't tell you the product. You can't tell us oh. the product? No, you I can't the tell you. <laughs> now, I'm allowed to show you, but some of these are oh. stories, like, they'll, they'll say, okay, you can show our stuff, but you can't tell you who it's oh. I think these are all on market right now. Uh, these are not on the first one is. The first one's on market. The second one is not. But you're not gonna go find a char one barrel. It's gonna be a blend. We we'll use five char one barrels, ten, and and two to one. Yeah, if you guys gotta go. Well, any questions, I'll be up here hanging out for a little bit. Okay. Some of them did and some of them didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I love wood. <laughs>